My name is Jeannie Yerman, and I'm senior director at Archie Group. We're a communications firm that works largely with FinTech. And today, we have a session here, a fireside chat, rise of B2B, BNPL, bank loan substitution, evolution, or revolution. To discuss, we have Yaakov Martin, he's with Jiffy, and Christine Roberts of Citizens, and they will hash it out. I'll take it away. Thank you. Christine, it's Hi. good to be here. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. It, um, it truly is a pleasure. I know that's often said, but this time, uh, I think we both mean it. Yes, very much so. I think we'd um, do a service to our audience here if we started off by defining some of the terms. There are many terms that are used to describe different types of function, functions of finance at point of sale, buy now, pay later, of course, being the buzzword for a bunch of years. Traditionally, point of sale financing, embedded finance or lending, What's your take on those terms? So I think, first of all, right, I think all lending is buy now, pay later. So let's, let's start with that, right? Um, but a great moniker for an area that's really pay and for. And I want to make sure we make that distinction because the, the new traditional uh, pay and for is uh, it's for payments over six weeks, right? And consumers have truly adapted to that idea. So point of sale financing, paying over time, embedded financing are very, very different things. Also different because they include underwriting, right? Which traditionally buy now, pay later does not. So I just want to make sure that we're all using the same language. Absolutely. And I, I think we'll try to cover the full gamut of uh, these different types of options, but we'll definitely focus on underwritten loans. Um, and we're here to speak really about B2B finance or B2B buy now, pay later, when and where relevant. And in order to create that distinction, I sometimes like to use the who, how, and where, meaning the differences between the B2B side of things and the B2C side of things is really who are we catering to, where are we catering to them, and how are we catering to them. So the who is pretty easy. Right? We speak about the difference between consumers, um, individual consumers, and, and the small businesses primarily. I mean, that's the topic of our discussion here today. Um, but we've spoken about this in the past, that there's a certain convergence, right? Yep. Um, small business owners are consumers themselves, and yep. they have learned to expect certain accessibility, certain products being offered. So think about it, right? There are 33 million small businesses in the country. And they are currently served by, you know, by traditional banks, right? There, there are some online financing for small businesses, but the reality is it's more traditional. You go into a branch, right? You open, open an account. Truth be told, they're consumers as well. And I think the expectation for small business owners is changing. They're going out receiving point of sale financing or buy now, pay later financing for themselves, pay over time. And the conversation is really starting to change about knowing that the data is available for small businesses and or for sole proprietors in the same way it's available for consumers. Why shouldn't they be served in that way? And the industry is starting to recognize that. And I think small businesses have always kind of been the, the side thought of lending. Not that we haven't loved small businesses and banking. They're fabulous. They're wonderful customers. We love them. But I don't think banks have traditionally invested in building out the capabilities for better uh, small business lending. And you know, I, today I have a great partnership with Sarah Lindstrom, who, who runs our small business bank, where we're coming together with companies like yourself to say, how do we evolutionize that, right? I don't think there's any revolution in lending that's truly going to happen, but how do we start meeting the expectation of the small business owner? through the same type of technological and data advancements that, that they are receiving as a consumer. So, but being able to build into the systems, right? So, I mean, tell me your experience and how do you attach the systems to be able to lend to them? Yeah, and, and, and that's really the, the question of where. Where does the offering meet the small business? So as you mentioned before, for decades and decades, of course, small businesses who needed finance would approach their bank. and. In that case, you're bringing the business to the bank. And I think what we're speaking about today with embedding this type of access is bringing the bank to the 
customer. Correct. Um, and, and where you meet the customer can really be interesting in B2B because it does, it's not a binary type of situation. It's not a, okay, it may be online or in store. It becomes much, much more sophisticated than that. I mean, small businesses could be placing orders on ordering systems, procurement systems, and other places. And the ability to really make those type of financial offerings accessible when and where it matters most is what we really try to do. Now, as you mentioned to me in the past, it's not always so simple. You're sometimes working on archaic systems and you have to build a layer either in it, on top of it, alongside, and make that finance uh, accessible and obviously then close the transaction out. Yep. And it's interesting to me because you then have to bring that system to your point. You've got an ordering system or a fulfillment system. So if you're somebody who is a small business owner and you're going to buy, you know, computers from, call it Micro Center, Best Buy, et cetera, you know, being able to place your order in person or online and then tying it all the way through to fulfillment for a small business, that translation, I think, is, is really where we're starting to see a lot of movement, right? I think at, you know, at another conference this year, they actually talked about, you know, the evolution of small business lending is the new frontier, right? It's just such an open opportunity to, to be transformative and allow small businesses better access to credit than what they traditionally have been able to, you know, to, to participate in because, look, as somebody who's a CEO of a, a, you know, of a small to medium sized business, you eat, sleep and breathe that business. So when do you have time to go to a bank, right? Or time to go do certain things. And so we're able to now start converging your consumer and your small business behavior so that you can, you can actually do it at the same time. And I think that's important to be able to support small businesses in the country to help them to grow and to help them to have access to credit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The the, the need for customization also for small businesses, meaning you have to make sure that the offer is relevant to the type of businesses that you're serving, to the type of transactions that you're serving. It's not a one size fits all. I do view, um, obviously, B2C as an important tool, but it is a whole lot more standardized. In these type of situations where you're customizing for small businesses, and like you're saying, you really are able to incur, encourage and uh, facilitate growth, you have to make sure that the type of um, loan program is relevant to the type of transactions that need to take place, the repayment is relevant, but more so today, it's all expected to take place at the point of access in real time. And building those things in, I think becomes um, an interesting challenge and for, for folks like us who um, concentrate quite a bit on the, on the front end and the underlying kind of infrastructure that allows that to live in various ecosystems, it requires a, quite a bit of creative thinking. It does, but let's, let's also be clear that traditional lending is not going to go away, right? There may now be, in the same way with consumers, we went from uh, credit cards and home mortgages, et cetera. We're adding additional products to fill in the gap of credit usage, the same is gonna hold true for small businesses. So traditional lending, half, you know, half a million, quarter of a million dollars and more, where you have to have more succinct underwriting in order to ensure that the business is capable of bearing the debt, that is still going to exist. But what this does is it allows those lower dollar transactions to flow through more freely with a, a, a more automated construct of underwriting that hasn't existed for, well, forever. That's, that's the third, the how, right? How the underwriting here is taking place. Um, with B2C, I think we definitely felt this type of pendulum movement, right? There was incredible, incredible growth, which is obviously uh, welcomed. It's wonderful to have financial offerings served up at the point of sale online, in store, and so on. Um, but we really saw a swing there where a lot of this activity was taking place, not always necessarily with the right type of safeguards and the underwriting that is, that is required. And then obviously, as soon as the market, market shifted, then some of those practices had to be tightened up and all of a sudden underwriting or at least reporting and so on and so forth was really required. What's interesting about the small business lending is it's been there obviously, like I said, for decades, and that type of underwriting is true underwriting. It's not a one size fits all, it's not only based on FICO, it actually has to take the real time data of the business and its performance 
take it all into account, and then finally make a decision. So this how of how do you underwrite the small business, how do you underwrite it in real time, becomes also a much, much more creative process and can be a whole lot more um, specific and, and customized, like I said, to the offering that is at play. Very true. Um, I guess one thing, though, I think is interesting from just from a, a conversation standpoint, you know, is there, is there truly a home for buy now, pay later in small business? That's a good question. <laughs> um, we have seen a bit of demand for it. Um, but I think, again, to your point, and we were discussing this a little bit earlier, that the buy now, pay later, as long as we, again, define it as the pain three, pain four, is often for much smaller ticket items, for example, as opposed to the average value of a transaction that is normally required by a, a small business. Um, and therefore, the demand is usually for some more sophisticated type of financial programs. Nevertheless, you did make a point, and maybe you'll share a little bit about this, about possibly how um, net terms and buy not pay later or pay in three, pay in four can have an interesting play between them. Yeah, I guess more from a curiosity standpoint on my side, right? Does buy now, pay later, again, because your small business owner, you know, is is actively using, obviously, you know, consumer financing, does that sort of become the next trend instead of net terms, right? So today they have a net 30, net 60, net 90. Why not a, a buy now, pay, a pay and for structure, very similar to what they're used to on their smaller ticket items as a consumer? So again, those are typically not underwritten. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not that starts to become a request or requirement from small businesses for institutions to be able to offer something like that. This is probably a good opportunity to say that we're happy for this to be interactive. So if anybody oh, yeah, would if like to. <laughs> exactly. Or, or comments about whether or not that is a requirement. I'll make one comment. Um, as you know, we operate today in um, about 11 or 12 countries. And obviously, there are different behaviors that have been entrenched in different markets for, for quite a while. So, for example, if, if you go out to Germany, um, Germany has basically had net terms built in to any type of transaction that is made by a small business. If a small business goes and shops at an IKEA, usually by definition they have some kind of invoice to pay or, or terms. In those type of markets, we are seeing more of a demand for convert that net 30 into a pay by three or pay by four. Um, however, in, in markets where the, the net terms is not necessarily the, the standard, we're not getting as much of demand. Interesting. It'd be interesting because we're typically, you know, call it five to seven years behind, right, financial trends in Europe. So it would be really interesting to see whether or not that starts to become a way for small businesses to better manage their cash flow, right, and, and their ability to pay on you know, on, again, on smaller ticket items. So It's we'll funny. I, I always find that there's this inferior complex. The Europeans think that they're five to seven years behind the U.S. And whenever we speak to our partners here, they feel that they're five to seven years uh, behind oh, Europe. Um, so I we'll do, have to prove out. <laughs> exactly. I do think that there's actually quite a bit of a difference between B2C and B2B. B2C here in the U.S., at least over the last few years, seem to advance quite quickly and lag behind in Europe. And with businesses, it's the opposite. At least okay. that's my take. No, I definitely. I mean, we've definitely seen differences in movement. And look, I think I think the pandemic changed how we all do business, right? And it accelerated the digital movement for consumers substantially. It's also starting. You know, the, again, the small business owners stood up and said, "Hey, wait, what about us too?" And so there's many of us who are converging around. How do we solve for this, right? Um, it's it's such an incredible opportunity. I mean, if you think about how many, again. 33 million small businesses, the amount of goods that are moved through small businesses, how do we support that? And, and how do we change the dynamic of traditional lending for them for better operating leverage? 100%. Um, we, I think this also takes us to a point that we're both quite passionate about, and that is uh, almost kind of the mission statement or the ethics behind B2B lending. And one of the things that excites us is the ability to empower small businesses. Yep. Um, it is one thing to finance consumer transactions. It's another thing to finance, uh, you know, 
the purchase of your 10th pair of Air Jordans and a paying three or paying four, which I think doesn't, yeah, doesn't necessarily get us up uh, in the morning and all rah-rah, uh, you know, with regard to that mission. But when it comes to small businesses, um, that often is the difference between the small business staying at a certain level and really growing and thriving, employing other people, putting food on the table for their own families. I think that's something that we're willing to work quite hard to make accessible. Very much so, and I think it's interesting. And you know, the last two days that I've spent, you know, here at the conference, walking around, which is very different. If I go back five years from going to a conference like this, how many more vendors and and potential partners are operating in the small business space from a risk perspective, a data perspective, analytical? I, I think it's starting to converge even within you know, the fintech world around how do we aggregate to be able to support. And it really is, a, it, I think it's a driving passion for a lot of people to say, hey, there's, there's so much here for us to change that we've got to be able to, we've got to be able to do it. You know, we solve for it so easy on the consumer side. Now many more great minds, I think, are coming together to figure out how we solve it for small businesses. Yeah. And, that, and that, makes me, that makes me quite happy because it really is the move from the focus on consumerism to growth, to yes. really enabling these, uh, these businesses to grow and to thrive. Um, and one of the things that we've also seen where the how ties into the where, we've seen interesting cases where depending on where you embed the access to B2B lending, you're able to actually pull additional data that can allow for proper underwriting. Um, sometimes that's in conjunction with some of these platforms where it lives in, and we often find ourselves more and more involved in orchestrating uh, that underwriting piece. And to your point, there is a need for a tremendous amount of creativity and technological advances, and, and, and therefore it's, it's good to hear that so many of the various parties here at this conference are really putting their best minds to it. Definitely. So. All right, we've got about three minutes left. I was wondering if there's, I can't see anybody out there, by the way, um, if there was any questions or thoughts or something that folks wanted to hear or talk about. Yes. So I would actually separate that out, right? Because paying for for consumers and, and point of sale financing for consumers has really, I think, evolved and separated. You know, I, so I run Citizens Pay for Citizens Bank, which is, point of sale financing with you know, you know, many merchants. And quite frankly, the, the buy now, pay later for consumers, I almost would say, based on the regulatory environment, they are looking for that to be dialed back a, a bit, right? Because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking, quite frankly, right? Some of the analysis that has come out. Um, by the way, Citizens is not, we do not do the, the traditional buy now, pay later, pay in four. Uh, we underwrite all of our loans, we report, you know, the credit bureaus, all that other, you know, happy stuff. But you've got consumers who are layering, you know, up to, you know, there's a percentage of BNPL consumers who are layering up to 40, right, pay in fours at the same time. So I think there's opportunity. I think small business owners, quite frankly, are a little bit more, typically a little bit more sophisticated. They wouldn't go to that extent, but I think there's opportunity for businesses to start taking on the, the point of sale financing, and they want it, and they need it. And so we're trying to solve for that with them. Um, but again, I think the debate right now is on the buy now, pay later, does it replace you know, term structures for, for businesses? I haven't heard the need for it, but you're hearing it in, you yeah. know, over in Europe. We haven't heard for the need for it yet in the US, but honestly, I think it's going to come. This, sorry, this is kind of a long-winded response. Yeah, it's, it's, it's evolving, so thank you. It is. It's interesting. I mean, the regulatory environment around buy now, pay later is, is probably a whole other session, right, that, that we could do from a, from a technological perspective. But, um, you know, I think there's really a lot of uh, eyes and attention from the regulators on how lending is evolving uh, within the different marketplaces, and I'm sure they will be coming out with some statements uh, around that for, for small businesses, too. Yes, they absolutely will. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Christine. This has been a pleasure, as always. As always. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, and our thanks to Yaakov Martin of Jiffity and Christine Roberts of Citizens. Thanks so much. It's been a great conversation.